Well, it is a, uh, a special Sabbath today in the uh, reality in that we will be sharing uh, in the Lord's table together. And so that is the main element of our, our worship that we're going to be participating with together. Um, but I do want to share a few comments um, from Scripture and uh, uh, some words to encourage us here uh, just by way of uh, acknowledgement and introduction to the Lord's table. And uh, I know we just uh, had prayer, but I always like to pray uh, also before I speak. So I'm going to bow my head here as well, if you would care to join me. Father, uh, we invite you again, Lord, and we ask that you would come into our hearts. And Lord, uh, this is a day that's all about you. And help us to remember and stay focused on the beautiful gift that you've given us and the hope that we have in you because of the gift of your sacrifice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you know, in the Adventist church, we have very few uh, elements that are highly ritualistic. Um, and largely a part of that is because following in the Protestant tradition, we're very wary of ritual not founded in Scripture. But in addition to that, as Adventists, we're also very wary of ritual that's founded only in tradition and not uh, also uh, based clearly on Scripture. But there are a few things that we continue to do as Christians that we see founded upon in Scripture. We still dedicate our children to the Lord. Uh, we still baptize. Uh, we, we see that very clearly in Scripture. Uh, we still have a marriage ceremony uh, and we encourage that. We think that that's still a ritual worthy of embracing. Uh, uh, at the end of life, we believe a memorial service, which uh, we don't always think in the context of ritual, but there is a lot of ritual involved in, in how we, uh, at least in a traditional way with pallbearers and, and, and things like that and how we, we do that type of thing. And then the communion service is another area uh, that we continue to embrace that is highly symbolic and, and filled with ritual. Um, that we have to learn from. Now, um, as we begin to prepare for the passing out of the elements and the other parts of communion, I just want to talk briefly about the what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why. Okay? And, and uh, to be very simple, obviously what we're doing uh, in this communion service is we're following what we see established in Scripture as a pattern of behavior and expectation ordained by God to bind His people together and remind us about the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are coming to the Father's table. That's why it's called the Lord's table. And I think it is fitting that we're honoring fathers, even though Father's Day was last Sunday, and this is after the fact. But there is a lot of tie-in with this being a celebration of what the Father has done for us. You understand that, right? This is, this is an, uh, an expression that God the Father gave us Jesus as a substitutionary atonement for our sins. And so that's what we're doing. We're honoring the Father. We're honoring the Lord for His provision. And we're trying to draw close to Him in fellowship and bind ourselves together. We are going to have the ordinance of foot washing as well, or the ordinance of humility. And um, I just want to read the passage that is uh, 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 indicator or poignant to the foot washing service, because I didn't grow up in, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And when I first uh, uh, saw that foot washing was attached to communion. It was very different to me. Uh, but yet we see that portrayed very clearly in Scripture. In John 13, and just going to uh, select uh, verses here, not going to do the whole chapter, but in verse 1 of John 13, it says, Now before the feast of Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Isn't that beautiful? And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he would come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Now, by the way, between John 13 and John 19, Jesus or the Scriptures will reference the Father 55 times. 55 times. Scripture will refer to God the Father in this dramatic portrayal of the sacrifice of Christ. So the Father was not a bystander to the sacrifice of Christ. The Father was not absent at the Lord's table when they had this Passover feast. It was definitely a part of the experience of Christ that He knew He was trusting the Father 
through this. And he wanted to be an illustration to the disciples. Even if you go through tough experiences, you can trust the Father, and He will bring all things uh, into perspective if we continue to trust in Him. And so we understand that Jesus at this time took on the role of the servant or even the slave. No one else was willing to wash those feet, and we could, uh, again, uh, talk at length about the dramatic moment uh, that that must have been like when Jesus got down and began to wash the disciples' feet and how Peter resisted. And I imagine you could have heard a pen drop during that time. Their jaws were probably hanging open as they saw Jesus doing this because this was just so not expected. And then Jesus asked the question, do you know what I have done to you? That's in verse 12, by the way. I just... Hang on to that for a second. Do you know what I have done for you? And even though this was a literal act of service, it's off, it is still uh, uh, just bathed in symbolism and in depth of meaning. He goes on to say, you call me teacher and Lord, you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I give you an example that you should also do as I did to you. So Jesus just makes it very clear. This is not just a one-time experience. This is something I want my followers to experience in connection with this sacred service. So um, in the Adventist church, we have taken that as very powerful in uh, in our time of sharing of the Lord's table. So we make provision for us washing each other's feet. Now, we no longer wear sandals and walk on dusty streets, so the the literal aspect of it is not as, as meaningful, but the symbolism of humility and of equality is just as powerful. Okay, and so, um, you know, it's mostly sock lint and things like that that get washed away when we do it. But we understand the meaning of it, that no matter who we are, we are brethren. We are brothers and sisters with one another. And so we participate in that according to the Lord's instruction, and we've made provision for that as well today. So we are going to be doing the foot washing service, and then we will gather back in the sanctuary uh, by the way, none of this is uh, obligatory. It is completely up to you. Uh, we'll have some music playing in the sanctuary if you choose to just uh, uh, remain in here. Or if you've never done it before and you just want to observe, you're welcome to come to the different areas where we have set up for that. And if you want to bring your kids so that they can observe, again, this is all voluntary. And we practice something called open communion. You do not have to be a member of this church to participate in either the foot washing or of the elements. We do ask that you be a committed person to Jesus Christ, though. Uh, And that, you know, we don't ask for any verification of that. That's between you and the Lord. If you've given your heart to Jesus and you want to participate, you're welcome to do that. Now, as far as the how, I just want to talk on the... uh, the, the frequency by which we're going to be doing this because that's the thing that's a little bit unique. To my knowledge, this is the first time, now some of you who've been here a while can correct me, but this is the first time this church has had communion during a regular Sabbath morning service in this building. Now, that may be, uh, there may be some memories out there that, uh, of, of doing it this time before. Um, the previous uh, pastor enjoyed to do an agape feast about once a year on an evening over in the fellowship hall. And I'm not here to say one is right or one is wrong, okay? But I just want to give you an idea of kind of how we have come to this point as a church of having communion and the frequency. Um, so when the apostolic church passed on their traditions and their beliefs and the Catholic church came along and became the dominant visible Christian element for over a thousand years over Christianity, they built a lot of uh, uh, additional traditions and ritual around the Lord's Supper and they call it the Eucharist as part of the Mass. Okay, And the Mass in Catholic tradition is the central act of worship. There is no act of worship superior to the Mass. It is the thing that establishes your place within the church and within the community and in the presence of God. And so that is the the Catholic understanding, and they practice it every week. As a matter of fact, it is not considered a worshipful thing to come into the presence of God and not partake of the Eucharist in Catholic tradition, okay? And and by the way, we're not here to debate or condemn. I'm just giving you the the history and the the, the theology. It is so powerful in their understanding that it is not considered appropriate to be in the presence of God if you're Catholic without participating in the provided elements, uh, particularly the bread. They don't always drink the wine. 
Um, so over a course of time, this was the way in which uh, the Lord's table, the Eucharist, was, was done through the, the majority of Christianity. Uh, in the Protestant Reformation, though, the Protestants said, look, we want to go by the Bible and the Bible only, and we don't see everything that you're doing here as necessarily biblical, and so they changed some of the things that were done. Primarily what was changed within the theology of the Lord's table is in within Catholic theology and tradition, you are imparting grace by partaking of the uh, elements. In other words, you are earning your salvation or your righteousness with God by participating. Protestants took um, uh, exception to that and said, we don't think that's right. We want to encourage you to participate in the Lord's table as a thank you for God's already providing grace and salvation, which, by the way, is the great divide between Protestant Christianity and Catholic Christianity. That is the main issue, one that says you can, through the sacraments and through other things, you are earning grace. You are receiving grace through your participation, and without doing those things, you are without grace. In the Protestant tradition, they said, no, God brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea first. He gave them salvation, and then he gave them the sanctuary. Then he gave them the law. Then he gave them the expectation. And so they changed it and said, we're not going to do these things to impart grace or receive salvation. We're going to do it because he's already done it. But both continued to believe that they were necessary. So some Protestants, in their attempt to be as as uh, non-Catholic as possible, said, we're not going to do it every week. We're going to do it less frequent. And uh, uh, part of it was reactionary, but part of it was they said, you know, when Jesus did it, it was the Passover. And how often was the Passover? It was once a year. So we're just going to do it once a year. So some Protestant um, uh, uh, groups ha have their uh, experience with the Lord's table once a year. Others continue to do it weekly and made very little changes. Lutherans and Episcopalians, very, uh, very uh, subtle differences in Anglicans between their uh, expression of the Lord's table and the Catholic expression. Others went uh, a different way and said, we're going to do it once a year. Uh, most Protestants fell somewhere in between. And they said, yes, Passover was once a year, but there were lots of festivals throughout the year. And all those festivals pointed to Christ one way or another. We don't want to do it once a year, but we don't want to do it as much as once a week. How about once a month? And so some Protestants said, well, we're going to do about once a month. Adventists fell kind of in between traditionally, along with Methodists and Reformed and things like that. We said, we're going to do it about quarterly. So the recommendation and the history and tradition of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to provide opportunity for the community to come together to have the Lord's Supper about once a quarter. Now, none of this is scriptural. The Bible simply says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you know, you proclaim the Lord's, you, the Lord's death until he comes. It doesn't say you have to do it weekly, monthly, annually. So it's not wrong. You understand me? It's not wrong if you have communion every week unless it becomes so normal to you that you miss the importance and the sacredness of the meaning of it. Nor is it wrong to only have it once a year, unless you miss it, and then it's every two years, and you miss out on the blessing of it. So you know what I'm saying? It's not that one is right, one is wrong, but we have, um, as a denomination, encouraged churches and the members of the church to make opportunity to, to share of the Lord's table about once a quarter. And that's what I would like to do here at Scottsdale Thunderbird. Uh, again, this is not to disparage uh, any of the previous things that were done in the past. Um, this is just part of what I would like to encourage us to do and the uh, scheduling that, that I will be moving forward with um, here. They will not always be on Sabbath morning. We will make alternative and, and special times as well for the sharing of the Lord's Supper. So the last thing I want to speak to is the why. And again, many sermons could be preached and many uh, 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 wonderful things could be studied about the purpose of this ritual and this symbol that we partake of. And I, wouldn't, I would struggle to say that one is the, the main thing and the other ones are secondary or, or ancillary or anything like that. As I look at them, all the purposes seem to be equally powerful. It is to commemorate and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. And that is primary. It is to come to the Lord's table and have fellowship with God. That is primary. Uh, that's not secondary. It is to draw the fellowship together and bind us as one body. That's not secondary. That's primary. So it's hard for me to say this is the first thing, and then these other things also come along. But I also want to share with you about the intimacy of this. The reason why we call it the Lord's table is that God 
the God of the universe, our creator, invites us into an intimate moment with him at his table. Okay, This is not just a, a, a casual thing that we do. By faith, we are coming to the most intimate moment that we can come with God. And I've used this uh, analogy before with you. you. Many of you may remember when you were dating your, your spouse or your loved one, uh, it may have began as a group thing, right? And, and, and you said, hey, it was fun to see you. Next time the group gets together, I hope you're there. And it's casual. And then the next time it goes up a little bit and you say, you know what? Uh, it was great to have this group thing. How about you and me just get ice cream together? By the way, for those of you who haven't done it, David, this is how you do it. And if you have any questions, just ask me. I'll let you know. Okay? And, and the intimacy grows. So you say, okay, that ice cream. Well, next time let's have coffee together. And it's growing. And then the next time it's like, ah, I'm really enjoying this. Let's eat together. What's happening? The intimacy is growing. And then what's the height of imp- intimacy? Hey, we've been doing this for a while. We're enjoying each other. Why don't you come to my parents' place? And we're going to have a meal together. And you go to the father's house. And you sit down at the father's table. What's happening there? You don't do this on date number one. Jim, did you do this on date number one, Jim? It, just all together. Just got it done with. These things grow over time until it reaches this point where you have succeeded in that level of, of relationship that you are now bound together as one where you're ready to make commitment. Okay? In a similar way, the Lord's table is an intimate invitation from the Father to come and sup with Him. And He has made the provision for you to be there free of guilt, free of concern, because His Son paved the way through His sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. So there are so many things that that are symbolized by what we do, but I want to come to one that you may not think of as very often, and it comes from the classic passage that we often read in the communion service from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably heard this so many times you maybe haven't memorized, okay? So here the Apostle Paul is speaking, and he's trying to train the young, wild, uh, rebellious church in Corinth how to have a successful church ministry, okay? Corinth was a difficult place. All right, and he says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. I receive from the Lord. So Paul says, look, this isn't my idea. This is what God has instructed me. He gave this to me, that which I also have delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after saying, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, as often, notice, it's not for as monthly or as annually or quarterly. He just says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. And by the way, some also say, well, it says for as often as you eat and drink, it's like communion. That's not a good, so some people say, every time I'm at McDonald's, man, it's communion. I'm eating the bread, I'm drinking the cup, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. That is not an accurate. Paul says, as often as you eat this bread, this specially dedicated and ordained bread, as often as you drink this cup in this context, dedicated for this purpose. So I, I reject that uh, idea that some Christians have and some Adventists even have, that whenever you have a meal, it's communion. Whenever you sit down and eat pizza or have whatever, it's the Lord's Supper. Uh, I, I think that that is a, a, a stretch. But notice what he says. And this is a part I want to emphasize with you about the why. About the why. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, drink this cup you, do any of you know the next word? You do what? You proclaim, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there's a lot of reasons why we do this ritual and we go through this experience, okay? It is to commemorate the death of Christ. It's to celebrate the work of God. It's to dine and sup with God the Father who's made the provision. It's to bind the body together, all right? It's to fill ourselves with the, with, the, uh, the, uh, with the Spirit of God and have His influence in our life. It's to receive the blood of Jesus Christ as the, the, the forgiveness of our sins. All these things that are there. But Paul adds this additional element. When you do this, you are proclaiming that you have accepted the death of Jesus 
as the atoning sacrifice for your life. It is a proclamation. Now, who's it proclaiming to? Who are we proclaiming to when we do this? We're proclaiming to everyone. First of all, we're proclaiming to God. We're saying, God, I accept what you've done for me. And through this symbolic act, I am receiving your sacrifice and your gift for me. I am proclaiming to the heavens. Let every angel and demon know that I accept his blood. I accept his sacrifice. You're proclaiming to the heavenly uh, uh, bodies and forces. Okay? You're also proclaiming to the church. You're proclaiming to your children. You're proclaiming to your spouse. You're proclaiming to everyone who's around you. I am part of this beautiful body that is part of the movement of Jesus Christ. You proclaim to the people that drive by on the street. And they may not ever walk through the door, but you can say, but in this church, we have embraced and accepted the death of Jesus. And he is the end all of our expression of worship. It is a proclamation. But you're also proclaiming to yourself It is a physical object reminder that Jesus Christ did everything necessary for your salvation if you accept it by grace through faith. It is a proclamation when you do this. Highly symbolic. I know, I remember as a kid, you know, holding that little waif and just going, what is this even about? I mean, it basically just disappears in your mouth into a little bit of juice, and it's like, man, I want a jug of that. I got this little juice. Okay, and I didn't always understand it. I, I can't tell you this morning I, I understand it completely now. But what I want to share with you is don't miss out on all of these realities. It is an act of faith, and all of it hinges on your attitude. Are you focusing and remembering and believing what Jesus has done for you. It's not about the tastiness of the bread. It's not about the quantity of the juice. It's not about the sock lint and the foot washing or anything like that. It's about, I am doing this because Jesus has asked me to. He has illustrated it for me. He has ordained it in Scripture. And by faith, I want to proclaim that his death was for me, that his life, his forgiveness are all provisions of God. And I am going to proclaim that through my participation in this simple service. Are you ready to do that today? Do you want to be part of an experience to proclaim your love for Jesus and your acceptance of his salvation? I hope that you are. I hope it's something that you will... um, Appreciate as an act of faith, as an act of community and fellowship, as an act of love. Let me pray with you and then I'll give you some more instructions. God, as we move forward in this service, may your spirit be with us. May we appreciate the beauty, the simplicity, and all of the symbolism intended in this simple act. Bind us together, Lord. Help us to remember all these beautiful truths. And Lord, help us especially to remember that by doing this, we are proclaiming that you have saved us, that you have done everything necessary for our salvation, that you died for our sins, that your blood was spilt on our behalf, and that you have cleansed us and made us righteous. Thank you, Lord, that we can do this. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.